Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to worship from Silver Spring United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are joining us this morning, uh, whether you are joining us for the first time or whether you worship with us regularly. Uh, we welcome you into this place where we say together with conviction that everyone has a place at God's table. Uh, take a moment and uh, fill out, if you would, the eConnect card. There will be a link to that popping up in the chat box if it has not already. Uh, that's just a way for us to know that you are worshiping with us. And it also is a way for you to let us know if you have prayer concerns that you would like to share or, or other needs that you would like to uh, let us know about. I uh, want to, uh, at this point, uh, say a word of welcome. Uh, our staff parish relations committee is going to uh, be coming now to share just a couple of brief words as we move into this Advent season together. Good morning. My name is Kyle Whitley and I'm a member of the staff parish relations committee. In our new normal, sharing with our staff how much we appreciate them seems particularly appropriate. We have been richly blessed during these times of uncertainty and challenge by our staff's dedication, creativity, grace-filled caring, and courageous innovation. Not only did they lead our transition due to the pandemic to remote worship and study, but they have led us in remote fellowship safely, socially distanced uh, witness and protests, uh, care, for, care for and celebration of our community and unexpected fun. Our staff and new lead pastor have also energetically led our pastoral transition. Good morning. My name is James Manley and I'm also a member of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. To thank them for their efforts, the SPRC invites you to join us in celebrating our staff with expressions of our thanksgiving for them. You can post a personal thank you or story on a kudo board at the links now appearing in the chat box for each member of the staff, including Reverend Alex, Reverend Michelle, Andrew, Miss Marie, Jen, Miss Marianne, Reverend Catherine, Kiana, Myra, and Rondell. You can also contribute to a love offering to be shared among the staff by giving online at the link in the chat box. You may also send a check to SSUMC 8900 Georgia Avenue, Silver Spring, Maryland 20910. Please post your thank you and make your contributions by December 15th. I am Patsy Brannan, also a member of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. In addition to what you've heard about our staff appreciation, we wish to express our gratitude to Reverend Michelle, who stepped beyond her roles and responsibilities during our transition to Zoom worship and to a new lead pastor by joining the worship team every week. As we settle into our new normal, she will return to her responsibilities of participating in the worship team twice a month. This will allow her to resume some of her other responsibilities that also need her attention. And with that, Reverend Alex, we're back to you. Thank you. And uh, let me just say, thank you. Uh, I am blessed to work with this team of people. And uh, I hope you realize what a blessing this staff is to this congregation. Uh, they, have, are, they have been creative. They have been incredibly welcoming and hospitable to me uh, in, in this time of transition. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's true that uh, if, a, if a lead pastor or a senior pastor looks good, it's because they have really good people helping them to get to that point. And we have really good people uh, who are uh, leading us in our staff, uh, in our ministries. And so thank you to them. Thank you, Staff Parish, for uh, those announcements and those words. Uh, would like to uh, now uh, move us into our call to worship as Miss Lillian comes to lead us and uh, Miss Jen will be uh, leading the congregation in the bolded responses. Oh God, whose will is justice for the poor and peace for the afflicted. Let your herald's urgent voice pierce our hardened hearts 
and announce the dawn of your kingdom. Before the advent of the one who baptizes with the fire of the Holy Spirit, let our complacency give way to conversion, oppression to justice, and conflict to acceptance of one another in Christ. We ask this through the one whose coming is certain, whose day draws near. Your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Now, please join in our opening song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As the Happy New Year. 
you may not be aware of the fact that uh, in the church we operate on a calendar uh, just as we have social calendars and, and civic calendars, a school year calendar, the church has its own calendar. And today is the first day of the church's calendar year, the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season of quiet, of centering, of, of introspection, of asking ourselves, what does it mean to welcome Jesus Christ once again into our world? and into our lives. And we mark the weeks of this season by lighting candles, which are here on our altar area this morning. Uh, we light each candle, uh, one new candle each week until on Christmas Eve, we light the center candle, the white candle that represents the presence of Jesus Christ coming into the world and into our lives once again. And so I invite you, if you have candles in your home, uh, there are ways for you to make your own Advent wreath, your own Advent candle uh, grouping. Uh, they can be candles of just about any color. Traditionally, they're either purple and pink or blue with, again, the white candle in the center. And uh, you may join with us as we go through this season of, of introspection and, and calming ourselves and looking for the presence of Christ. Uh, and light your own candles along the way. I would invite you now to join with Miss Lillian and uh, Miss Jen will lead us in our response as we light our first Advent candle. Prepare the word of the Lord. We light this candle in love, the love that Jesus our Savior has for us. Prepare then the way of the Lord. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring all nations and all people under your loving rule. We know about, believe in, and hope for that future advent of your kingdom because we know about, believe in, and find hope in your first advent in Bethlehem. As we enter into this new season today, help us to be expectant people Bend our thoughts and aspirations beyond the moment, beyond what we can see in front of us at any given time. Although we want to do our daily tasks well and to your glory right now, help us to be people who also look ahead, who peer around various cosmic corners, and who know that the ultimate things of existence in this universe are the things that have been secured for us through Jesus Christ and that are real already now in the kingdom he established. In Advent, we sing about our hope, our hearts being open for you to enter in. May we, by the grace of your spirit, be open indeed. Make us open to the ways your kingdom can influence our decision-making at work, at school, at home. Make us open toward others, enabling us to see each and every person we meet as Jesus in our midst. Make us open to opportunities to serve others, to serve your whole creation out of devotion to you and to your son, who showed us what true service is all about when he came down to this world to salvage the universe you had fashioned in the beginning. As people whose hearts are open indeed, we make petition this morning for your needy world. This Advent season sees a world struggling with illness, with violence, with anger, a world that strikes the unexpecting and unsuspecting. It is easy, oh God, for us to see why this world needs saving, but sometimes it is not easy to believe that in Jesus Christ you have already worked to save it. Beyond the glitter and goodwill and the cozy warmth of the Christmas season, God, help us as Christians and disciples to find in Jesus' birth long ago a true reason for hope in this present moment. And then lead us to be workers for peace, bearers of shalom, agents of healing in a world gone mad. Here in this place, you see the needs and hurts of our members and friends during this new season. Stand close to anyone who has gathered with us this morning who struggles. Be with students who are struggling 
to learn over Zoom and through the distance. Be with families who feel the distance between them as they wish to gather for these holidays and find themselves unable to do so. Be with parents here who have cause for concern perhaps over a child's life and who want to see that child flourish and prosper. Lift the clouds of depression from those who wrestle mightily with their emotions. Minister to those who have chronic pain and bring them relief, we pray. Lead to a better time those who are unemployed, who are worried about family finances, those who wonder what the new year may hold. Grant that the coming weeks and months will hold new and good and wonderful things for those seeking a meaningful outlet for the gifts you have given to them. You alone see us as we are. And so we beg for you to nurture us according to our needs, to minister to us according to our hurts, to heal us in all those places where you see that we are broken or sick. But despite whatever happens in our lives or whatever is going on at this present moment in our various hearts and minds, we still do adore you, God of wonder and glory. We worship you. We lay our hearts open before you. And so in this space where we are gathered, we ask that you would come also to us by your spirit. Our hearts are open. Be born in us anew this day so that every day we may spread the increase of your peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the child of Bethlehem, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray together as his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now uh, Reverend Catherine is going to come and I think it's time for the kids to come a little closer to their computers as she comes to uh, share in our children's time. Hello, it's my turn. And today we're going to have a very exciting Hebrew lesson because if you can't learn a little Hebrew at church, where can you learn it? Come on closer. I want you guys to repeat after me. I think you might be surprised to find out how much Hebrew you already know. Can you say hallelujah? You just said in Hebrew, praise the Lord. That's amazing. You're almost fluent already. That's exactly what hallelujah means. Praise the Lord. Here's another one. It's a new one. We say hallelujah a lot, but we don't say this other one that frequently. You ready? Emmanuel. I don't, I don't see any lips moving. Let's try this again. Emmanuel. Yeah. Do you know what you just said? You said in Hebrew, God with us. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. Praise the Lord. God is with us. We just said a prayer in Hebrew. What does it mean to say God is with us? I think we're learning lots of new ways that God is with us this time because I am clicking through the gallery right now and seeing all kinds of people that I am with. Some of you are with people sitting on the sofa on laps maybe or with an arm around you. Even if you're not with somebody right next to you on the sofa, you're with we're all together with each other. And that's one of the things that we mean when we say Emmanuel, God with us. Sometimes we need a little reminder. I'm going to share with you some of my reminders that God is with us. You know the children's message, sheep. Honestly, this was not one of my reminders back in March. It's turned into a reminder. God is with me. Not God used to be with me 
or God will be with me. God is with me. The cross, that's another reminder. God is with us. The candles, I didn't light another one because Reverend Alex lit our first candle. God is with us. The Bible, when we read the Bible, we know God is with us. Maybe it doesn't always feel like God's sitting right next to you on the sofa with God's arm around your shoulder. But whether it's God with God's arm resting around you or God encountered through Zoom or God felt when you're on a walk through your neighborhood and you see and hear other people laughing and running and playing and you feel the wind blow, God is with us. Not just God used to be with us. Not just God will be with us again someday. God is with us. Now I'm gonna put these reminders down and put my hands together. Can we pray together? We're gonna to start this prayer in Hebrew, by the way. Hallelujah, Emmanuel. Thank you, God, that you are with us. Amen. Thank you all. The scripture lesson this day 
is from Isaiah, reading Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 17, the Common English Bible. The sign of Emmanuel. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign from the Lord your God, make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I won't ask, I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and she is about to give birth to a son and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring upon you, upon your people, and upon your families, days unlike any that have come since the day Ephraim broke away from Judah, the king of Assyria. Hear what the spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. I grew up participating a lot in the music ministry in my home congregation, singing in the youth choir and in the chancel choir. And those of you who have been in a church choir or in music ministry know that often you start rehearsing and preparing for Christmas in late summer. Uh, so I start getting an itch for Christmas music long before Christmas ever actually gets here. But now it's official radio stations are playing Christmas music is in the air around us. For many of us, it doesn't start to feel like the holiday season until we've got our Christmas playlists keyed up and ready to go. In my family, that includes the soundtrack to a Peanuts Christmas. It includes the music of John Rutter and the Cambridge Singers and Christmas albums by the Indigo Girls, Pentatonix and countless others. Music and the familiar Christmas carols in particular, they play a bigger role in making it feel like the holiday season than it does for any other season in the church's calendar. So I thought it would be a good opportunity as we begin this season of Advent to look at some of those hymns and carols that are most familiar to us and explore how it is they put scripture into song and tell us about who Jesus is. And if there's one hymn or carol that we use consistently to start the season of Advent, it's the one we just sang, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I don't know about you, but when I think of the season of Advent and how we start that in the church, it's this hymn that always springs to my mind. It has a long history. This text dates back more than 1,200 years. It was originally written in Latin. It grew out of monastic worship. And if you listen carefully, you can hear that tradition of chant, even in the way it is sung today. The tune that we most often used to sing it is from 15th century France. The most commonly used translation into English was done in 1861 by John Neal. This is a hymn that has a long and rich tradition of being sung at this time of year. There are a number of stanzas and a series of what we call antiphons, uh, short sentences, one or two sentences long perhaps, that might be read aloud just before each of the stanzas of the hymn. They each describe Jesus using a different name, Emmanuel, Dayspring, Wisdom of God, and more. And the refrain that we sing is both hopeful and at the same time, in a sense, almost pleading in its sound. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel will come to thee, O Israel. Now that hymn connected with Advent and Christmas makes Emmanuel a name for Jesus Christ. And it gets most explicitly spelled out that way from the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew cites the passage that we just read, that Lillian just read for us, 
as he is describing Jesus coming into the world. Jesus coming is to fulfill that prophecy, he says. But Matthew gets that connection from our text from Isaiah that we read. Matthew tells of Mary's pregnancy, Joseph's reaction to it. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. Now, if you listen carefully, I'm going to uh, carry on Reverend Catherine's lesson in Hebrew from just a few moments ago and toss in a little Greek while I'm at it as well. If you listen carefully, that is not what was actually read just a moment ago. That's because Matthew, as he writes his gospel, as he is looking at these texts of the prophets that are sitting on the desk next to him, perhaps, he is not looking at original Hebrew texts, but at Greek translations of the text. The Hebrew word in Isaiah's prophecy is Alma, which just means a young woman of marriageable age. It doesn't say anything in the text about whether she's a virgin or not. But when Isaiah was translated into Greek, the translators decided to translate that word as parthenos or virgin. And so the meaning of the text got changed just a little bit. So the hymn is drawing from Matthew. Matthew is drawing at least through translation from Isaiah. So what does that mean that Emmanuel really means? What does it mean in Isaiah? There's some background to our scripture this morning that will shed some light on things, but I have to say that it's here that things get complicated. In fact, as I was studying this week and preparing for this sermon, this sermon got complicated. If you're not careful, that's what happens as you study scripture. It's what happens when you start digging into a text that I preached on uh, several times before in the past. It's a text that I know well, And you think it can't surprise you, but it does. In our text this morning, you see, Ahaz is worried, really, really worried. He is the king of Judah, and he and his kingdom are facing a major attack. After Solomon became king, Israel, uh, after Solomon's rule, Israel was divided into two uh, as his descendants couldn't keep things together anymore. The northern kingdom kept the name of Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. Those two kingdoms, unfortunately, didn't really get along. And now the northern kingdom of Israel has teamed up with an ally, the kingdom of Aram, and they are about to attack the kingdom of Judah. Ahaz is desperate. He is looking for allies of his own. He is preparing to face what he fears could be an overwhelming attack from two joined enemies. At this moment, he's gotten off his throne in Jerusalem, and he is personally inspecting the city's water supply. That's where Isaiah comes to meet him in our text this morning. Isaiah comes to him with a word from the Lord. God has spoken to Isaiah and has told him that this attack will fail, and now he needs to deliver this message to a very fearful King Ahaz. But Ahaz is still really, really worried. He doubts whether God will actually save the people of Judah and Jerusalem. God speaks through Isaiah, ask me for a sign. Ask me for any sign and I will give it to you so that you will know that I will save you. But Ahaz will not do it. He will not ask for a sign. In Hebrew, faith to ask for a sign from God is is proof of your doubt. It is proof that you aren't sure that God will carry through on the word that has been given. So Ahaz responds, I won't ask, I won't test the Lord. But God and Isaiah see right through that. God's going to give you a sign anyway, Ahaz, because God is getting tired of your doubt. Now, what happens next isn't exactly clear from the text, but it seems that there's a young woman nearby. This is a spot where people would regularly do their laundry outside the city walls, and maybe that's why she's there. Isaiah, looking around, 
sees her. She catches his eye and he points to her at God's prompting and says, okay, Ahaz, do you see that young woman over there? She's going to have a son. You don't think that God will save Judah. You are running around making quick deals with your neighbors in hopes that one of them will come to your rescue. Well, guess what? She has more faith than you, and she is going to name that child Emmanuel. God is with us. That child has a future. But before that child is even old enough to make choices between right and wrong, this problem that you're facing is going to go away. Both of the kingdoms that you're concerned about will be in ruins. Now that is a sign. In the middle of Ahaz's fear and doubt, in the middle of his frantic rush to save his skin, God puts a promise into flesh and blood right in front of him. It's a sign that he can't ignore. This child is going to grow up probably in the city, right in front of his eyes, a living and constant reminder of the saving power of God. Emmanuel comes to be a symbol of that saving power. Later on in Isaiah 8, the name appears again to talk about God's presence, even in the midst of a crisis, as a saving and protective force in the land. We often use the name Emmanuel to talk about Jesus as God's presence with us. And we mean that in a couple of different ways. If you want to get into technicalities of theology, Jesus is fully God and fully human, the Word of God in flesh. And in that sense, he is quite literally God with us. In Jesus Christ, God comes into creation in a new and unique way. He shares in our very human condition. In Jesus Christ, God experiences what we experience. He gets hungry. He comes to know the pain of loss in the death of a close friend. He knows about betrayal and hurt as his disciples desert him on the night when he is arrested. He experiences death in pain and anguish. When we say that Jesus is Emmanuel, we say that God is with us in this world and in its joy and pain, in its beauty and its messiness. But God isn't just with us in that sense of being present with us in all of this. The statement, God is with us in the name Emmanuel, isn't meant as just a neutral statement of fact. God isn't just with us in the same way that I might occupy space with others. Sometimes we can say that we're with someone, and we mean that in only the most superficial way. I'm on the road, perhaps in my car, and I happen to be going in the same direction as someone else. I guess you could say that I'm with them, but I'm more just alongside them. But when this young woman names her child Emmanuel, it's not just a statement of God's presence. It's a claim about God's participation. God isn't just an observer. God is with us because God is on our side, on our team, working on our behalf, not a neutral party, but one who is deeply invested in working for our good and for our well-being. God is with us. Now, this is where it gets complicated, though, as I mentioned just a moment ago, because there is another side to the sign. Emmanuel is a sign of God's active for us presence in the world, and in that sense, it is a sign of hope and faith. But as soon as God has given this sign, there is an immediate turn in our text. Isaiah continues, As for you, Ahaz, I'm going to bring upon you and your house days like you haven't seen before. Days like the ones right after Isaiah. Those were not good days, Ahaz. Assyria, another enemy, is going to come. Emmanuel is a promise of God's presence, but that presence can mean different things. For those who put their trust and faith in God, Emmanuel is a sign of God's saving love. For God's people, but for Ahaz, 
For those who want to try to secure their own future by worldly means, Emmanuel uncovers the futility of that effort in a kind of judgment. There's always another crisis. There's always another force that threatens to overwhelm us. When Israel and Aram are laid waste in the distance, Assyria will be marching toward Jerusalem. And after that, there will be something else and another crisis, then another, then another. But even in the midst of that next crisis, Isaiah says, people will still hold fast to the conviction of Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God will still save, even in the face of those ever-increasing odds. But poor Ahaz, he can't see that through his own fear. The only solution to his problem that he can imagine is the one that he can invent, the scheme that he can formulate. He can't accept, in a sense, the fact the good news, that the fate of himself, the fate of his nation, the fate of the world is outside of his own control. It's beyond any of us. Faith, whether it's in the Hebrew Bible with Isaiah or in the New Testament with Matthew or sung every morning as we gather for worship, lives in this curious, difficult tension. It starts from the acknowledgement that ultimately we can't save ourselves. God knows that we have seen our fair share of distress and fear this year. We have faced, we are still facing, a serious disease that has killed hundreds of thousands of people in this country alone. We continue to confront issues of racism and violence and fear, Saving, saying that the faith that God is with us in the midst of these crises is not an invitation just to passive acceptance of how things are, or just sitting around and waiting for God to do something. It is a declaration that the future is ultimately not in our hands, but in God's hands. And it's our conviction that our work in the world confronting these crises and, and these hurts and heartaches has meaning precisely because God is at work alongside, with, and through us. Our small actions can seem insignificant when you measure them against the hurt and the heartache, the fear and pain in the world. These are great big cosmic struggles that we're talking about. But our actions have meaning in those struggles when and because they are aligned with the love of God that has already been declared to be doing things in the world already. God is with us. The fate of the world is not ultimately under our control or of our making, but it is held in the hands of a God who loves it so much that God is not passively sitting by and watching. God takes sides in the world on behalf of the hurting, on behalf of the fearful, on behalf of the struggling and the suffering and the oppressed. Where Ahaz cannot see any power at work beyond his own ingenuity, we see the power of God at work alongside our own lives. When we can't see a way to save ourselves from disaster, Emmanuel points us to where our ultimate salvation lies in the love of God. And so this morning, we pray, as Christians have done for nearly two millennia, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And we take comfort in the promise that God is with us and for us in the middle of crises, in the middle of whatever crisis will come next. We can rejoice. Emmanuel will come, has come, will come again not just to Israel, but to us. And he brings us hope because he is God's promise in flesh and blood that we, like that child born so long ago, have a future. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen.
as God's people of Advent, as we wait for that day when Christ is born anew into our lives and when Christ is born anew into this world, when Christ comes again in final victory, we strive to align ourselves with what God is doing in the world. We know that it is not within our power to save creation. But in the things that we do, we bear witness to what God is doing in the world. We point once again to that child. We point to the child born in Bethlehem, and we say God is with us in all of this. And that is why we do ministry in the church. That is why we reach out to the poor and in love and concern. That's why we hold each other tight in times of trouble and anguish. It's why we keep these stories alive as we teach them to our children in Sunday school. It is because that is where our hope lies. As we point to that, I would invite you to take a moment and think about how you might join with us in ministry. We talk a lot about joining with us in ministry through financial gifts, but there are ways that we are in ministry together that are not just financial and giving. Perhaps you're being called to one of those ministries right now. But if you are wanting to support this ministry financially, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can visit our website. A link is in the chat box. And uh, there you can find a way to give a one-time or a recurring gift. You can send a gift by mail to the church office and we will uh, take that and, and, and use it as good stewards, we pray, uh, for the glory of God and for the ministry of Emmanuel, God with us. As we spiritually gather those gifts together in this time, I would invite you to join with Miss Lillian as she leads us in our prayer of dedication. As they offered gifts most rare, at that cradle, rude and bare, so may we with holy joy, pure and free from sin's alloy, all our costliest treasures bring Christ to thee, our heavenly King. Now is the time in our service when we reflect on the opportunities for mission and ministry this week and, uh, and in the coming weeks. Uh, as is our custom, there are many, there are many things. Uh, it is the start of a new season um, and uh, a busy season at that. And so we want to make sure you are aware of all the ways that you can connect, uh, can serve, and can uh, study and worship together uh, this season. Uh, Advent studies begin today. They begin today at five o'clock. Uh, there are two um, sort of choices for studies, although they uh, meet at different times. The one at five that, that begins at five today um, is being run by Laura File Long and uh, using the book All the Earth is Waiting. Um, and it connects themes of Advent to creation care. Um, if it, this snuck up on you and you're interested in participating and you don't have a book and you haven't read yet, it's okay, you should still go. Uh, log on at five o'clock, uh, you'll get a sense for the, the group, for the themes. Um, we have a couple of extra books around the church also, so just let, let me know if you need one, um, we can get you one uh, quickly. So uh, that's the one that meets tonight. The one that we'll be, uh, we'll, we're doing on Monday nights from seven to nine. And then in the women's group on Thursdays at 10 uh, is uh, piggybacking off of themes from Reverend Alex's sermon series about songs for the season. So we will be talking about our favorite Christmas songs um, and maybe some Christmas and Advent songs that we uh, may be less familiar with, uh, with, learning some of the histories, listening to some beautiful performances, uh, and just taking some time to, to bask in the balm of music together um, during this season. Uh, feel free to email me or uh, find information on the website or on the Facebook page for uh, more if you have any questions about those studies. Um, the Advent Photo Devotional on Facebook begins today. It's very exciting. Uh, I am going through and scheduling posts all throughout um, throughout the season. There's still room for more photos. There's always room for more photos. Um, as you are getting out your decorations and reflecting on seasons past, um, think about your favorite photos that capture the themes of Advent for you, um, whether they're explicitly uh, 
Advent or Christmas uh, doesn't matter. Um, just feel free to sign up and to send them my way. I would love to share them with our community as we remind ourselves of all that we are waiting for this season um, and all that, uh, that Jesus brings to us in Christmas. We have a craft along night scheduled for Friday uh, at seven o'clock. Uh, the only materials you need are materials that you have. I am almost, I almost guarantee you that you already have them. And if you don't, let me know and I will bring them to you. Um, you need a CD, an old CD, a DVD, any kind of CD that you are willing to transform into something lovely. And then string or an old t-shirt or old pieces of fabric or yarn, really any kind of textile thing will totally work. Uh, we're gonna do some weaving together. Uh, we'll make some, some beautiful things that you can hang in windows or on your Christmas tree and it'll just be a nice time to uh, be together and, uh, and make, something, make something pretty together. Uh, so all are welcome for that. It's a little late, uh, may not be best for young children, but, um, but all, are, all are welcome. The December Dinner Fellowship uh, evenings begin this week. Um, those are being hosted on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Uh, there's a Zoom link. You can just log on and hang out with some, uh, with some church friends. You don't have to be eating dinner if six o'clock is not your dinner time. You can make some appetizers. You can just come to chat. You can jump in and out. Uh, just a great time to have some fellowship. The nights are long, friends, and it is good to be together during them. Um, there's no preparation. There's no study. Um, just an opportunity to connect. Um, so those are on Wednesdays in December, um, beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, and then some of you, uh, I have noticed, um, have uh, having been in, have been engaging uh, on the Facebook page in really lovely ways lately. Um, we've made some Facebook posts, uh, turned them into some some ads that are going around our community, inviting people to come and worship with us this season. Um, so we encourage you to share those. Um, find them on the Facebook page. They have um, a lot of a lot of information about what we're doing this year for Advent. It directs the directs folks to a place on the website that's all about Advent. Um, it has all the resources all in one spot. Um, it's, it's easy to share them uh, on your Facebook page and in, invite people uh, to, to come and join us. Um, this is a, a season when a lot of families uh, who may not usually be connected to a church often choose to visit um, and, and they may be missing that this year, um, not knowing how they can uh, be connected um, if, they, if they aren't already engaged in a community. So. Um, please invite folks, uh, use those resources or any others um, that, you, that you can think of. Um, and uh, let's make sure that everyone has a place to celebrate this season um, together. And with that, uh, I invite you to join in our closing hymn, just the last few verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, led for us beautifully by Ken and Marilyn Parr.
part of the holiday season, part of Advent is about inviting people into community. Uh, it's about the community of our families. It is about the community of our congregation. And it's an opportunity, as, as Jen was saying, to invite people to be a part of that. Uh, how easy is it? Well, uh, let's see, I'm on our Facebook page. This is uh, uh, one of the things she had mentioned talking about what we're doing this Advent. I go down, there's a little button that says share. I click it, I click share now, and I may have just invited someone to church next week. It is that easy. Uh, someone who is longing and hurting right now might find in that little action, it took two seconds, a word of hope. And you can share that too. Don't just share it on Facebook. Share it with every person you talk with. Share it with people that you, you meet, uh, perhaps when you are out in our community. Because we are people of Advent. We are people of Emmanuel. And as you go forth from this place, go to love God and serve your neighbor in all that you do. So that those to whom loves a stranger might find in you generous friends. Go in the name and power of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer now and always. Amen.